Since the dawn of civilization, spies of every nation and culture have worked to infiltrate their adversaries and glean the information that will give their side the advantage. The stakes are sky high, the strategies varied and imaginative, and the ultimate sign of success is that no one ever even knew you were there. In each episode, we will explore the moral and ethical gray zones of espionage, where treachery and betrayal go hand in hand with cunning and courage. This is the Spycraft 101 podcast. Welcome to your clandestine classroom. This is episode number 141 of the Spycraft 101 podcast. My guest today is Aaron Stark. Aaron served in the U.S. Army as an Apache helicopter pilot, including on two tours in Afghanistan. He finished his term of service teaching at his alma mater, West Point Military Academy, as an assistant professor of economics after completing his master's in business administration at Harvard University. He is now the director of business intelligence at a Fortune 500 tech company. This is Aaron's second appearance on the podcast. You may remember him from episode 99 when we discussed his book, Disrupting Time, Industrial Combat, Espionage, and the Downfall of a Great American Company. On that episode, we discussed industrial espionage by the Swiss watch industry against the Waltham Watch Company in Waltham, Massachusetts. That's a terrific story that I definitely encourage you to go back and listen to if you haven't already heard it. I invited Aaron back onto the podcast to discuss another subject with which he's very familiar, Benedict Arnold, probably the most famous trader in American history. Arnold served as a general in the Continental Army until his shocking defection to the British Army. But first, I want to say a big thank you to everyone listening who is also supporting me on Patreon, including Connie T. and Andy H. Your monthly contributions there help me keep this podcast going week in and week out. As a way of thanking my patrons, I offer a lot of great freebies and promotions, including free and discounted books and products from the Spycraft 101 store. Patrons also get exclusive access to long-form articles of mine that aren't available anywhere else. If you haven't signed up for my Patreon yet, but you want to, just click the link in the show notes on whatever podcast platform you're listening to right now. Aaron, welcome back to the podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's great to be back. Fantastic. Our discussion about Waltham is honestly still a personal favorite of mine, so I'm glad to learn that you knew a lot about another very important subject that I've been wanting to cover for a long time here now. Yeah, I'm really excited to be back with you and to tell you about this new research interest. Yeah, so on that note, what we talked about last time was industrial espionage at the turn of the 20th century. So what was it that brought you over to Revolutionary War history and Benedict Arnold? Yeah, so obviously not quite a straight line between the two. I would say I've always been fascinated by just the history of the places around me where I've lived. And this one is no exception. Disrupting time was the outcropping of, you know, you remember I received a pocket watch when I was in graduate school and it was an heirloom from my great grandfather and it was a Waltham. And I happened to be living just down the road from the Walt- the old Waltham factory there outside Boston. And it led to this like years long adventure of research and discovery that ultimately resulted in uncovering a case of industrial espionage that had really been hidden in the shadows for, you know, almost 140 years. And so this particular episode also rose from being a local history. So I, at the time, was living in Haverstraw, New York, while I was teaching up at West Point. And being a natural history buff, I was running along the trails and saw this sign that talked about You know, within these woods in 1780, Benedict Arnold and John Andre met. And of course, if you follow the Revolutionary War history, you know, this is a huge event in history and to want to discover more about it. So kind of use those same research skills from researching disrupting time and looking in old manuscripts and documents and kind of tracing actually what happened. You know, most of the books on Benedict Arnold focus on, you know, kind of the strategic level things, what happened. His meeting with Andres, you know, maybe a paragraph, if that. And so I really wanted to understand what happened, what was like the play by play, especially being stationed at West Point. Those were the plans that Arnold was to have given up and so sought to use these old sources to literally track what happened almost hour by hour through this period in time. And it turned into a very fascinating research tale. It, it certainly is. I'm glad we had the chance to talk about it. It's really amazing how many like innocuous spots, like just a place out in the woods right there with a sign attached. So that's kind of a major turning point in American history. 
Absolutely. And it's literally, uh, you know, if you are uh, familiar with the area, it's, you know, between Haverstraw and Nyack, New York, there's a, a park called Hook Mountain State Park. And it is literally a sign. And, you know, as we get towards the end of this episode, I can, I'll tell you exactly where to find it, how to orient yourself as you're there to see where they would have almost like sat for this to happen and where Andre would have landed. But it's really cool that it's like literally there in the middle of the woods. Oh yeah, that's fantastic. And I don't know if you've seen it on my own Instagram page or if uh, any of my listeners have, but I love visiting these sites where these actual meetings took place. You know, I visited the spot where a payphone used to be, for example, and hardly anybody but me would find that interesting, you know, but I, I just love it. Honestly, Absolutely. It's, it's amazing how many things are in, you know, history really is all around us in so many ways. It's amazing. Absolutely. So before we talk about Arnold, I am curious, are there any other like lesser known cases of revolutionaries returning to the loyalist camp during the war? Because I mean, America was a very new idea in that sense. So I have to wonder if people had second thoughts, if you're aware of any, because I am not personally, although I'm not super well versed on revolutionary war history. So I don't know, necessarily know if, you know, people that really kind of engaged in this level of espionage that Arnold attempted to, but just like going back, I mean, if you kind of like think of the, what was going on at the time, you know, there's a lot of, it, it's a, the whole revolutionary war is a very nascent concept. This idea that they're going to break away from the biggest and most powerful nation in the world is, is really hard to imagine and put ourselves in those shoes. So I'm not familiar with any exact cases, but you'd have to imagine, you know, there was a lot of, you know, maybe second thoughts people had, or even as the war drug on, I mean, we think about it as like, oh, it was a war that happened. I mean, you're talking a war that literally lasted in earnest for seven years. So you have to imagine there's some people that are at some point, you know, either thrown in the towel or just trying to gauge, you know, where they're going to be successful and who's going to be in power when this thing's all over. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm certain there. It was not a sure thing, as we all know now in hindsight that it was. But I'm certain like year three, year four, year five, you know, maybe the British are making advances in one way or another. And they're thinking this, this is a horrible mistake. Yeah. On our part. We never should have strayed from the crown, so to speak. I'm sure that passed through a lot of our people's minds. Yeah, for sure. So let's talk about Arnold. Then in that case, can you just talk about kind of his birth and his young life growing up before he actually uh, joined the Continental Army? Yeah. So as a basic, you know, level setting here, Arnold was a two-star general. And so this was, you know, a period in history when, you know, generals only were three stars, the concept of four mm. or five-star general had not even come around yet. So oh, wow. he's fairly high up in the Continental Army. He was a war hero. And by many accounts, he was Washington's favorite general or one of his favorite generals. And he grew up, he was a merchant, and he joined the Continental Army. There was no professional soldiering, nothing that would lead you to believe he was going to be, you know, the next guy. But he, by all accounts, as a war hero, is we might even kind of think of him as like the patent of his of the Revolutionary War. Oh. He won at Saratoga. He was considered the hero of Saratoga. And in fact, if you visit the Saratoga battlefield, you can see a monument there to Arnold. And so he was, you know, quite the hero. He had been up to Quebec and, of course, Saratoga. And there's a great recounting of, you know, his battles in Saratoga that you should read and kind of talking about his time in, in upstate New York. But during this time when he was, when we're going to talk today in 1780, he's kind of a celebrity. And, of course, you know, we're going to also talk about this by John Andre. John Andre was kind of a British Army celebrity in America. So we, the fact that well, we kind of have these two celebrity military figures that a lot of people would have heard of at that time coming together meant that it was quite the scandal in America when it happened. And as a result, there was a lot of sources that were written about this. And in fact, a lot of them within a generation of when everybody lived. So a lot of these accounts that we're going to hear today are actually first person or, you know, second or third person accounts, but all within you know, 50 years of when these events happen. So it becomes this a, a great opportunity to see into exactly what happened through these two kind of military celebrities of their time. Yeah, absolutely agree. I was not aware that John Andre had a reputation prior to all of this. Though, so I'm looking forward to learning about that too. Yeah. So Andre, he was the adjutant for General Clinton, who is the commander in America at the time for the British. He had risen up from humble roots, son of a merchant, and he bought a commission when his father passed away and he came to America. And he was actually quickly captured in Canada by the Americans in 1775. But he ended up being released and he joined as a staff officer and quickly rose kind of to the top 
and he became Clinton's adjutant. And Clinton actually had to go to bat for him to get him a commission as a major. At hmm. first, this commission was turned down because they said, well, Andre's too young. He can't be a major already. But Clinton went to bat for him. And tragically, Andre didn't even know about all of this taking place because word of it finally coming back approved, Andre hadn't heard about before he was captured ultimately by the Americans here in 1780. Hmm. But he was quite the superstar, the military superstar. And you, you might think we, we call him the adjutant. We might think about it as the chief of staff. But he was also Clinton's spy chief in America. Clinton didn't really have an organized military intelligence structure. So Andre kind of became the de facto manager of military intelligence. And he was you know, quite known in the social circles, both in Philadelphia when the British occupied Philadelphia, and then again in New York when they, were, when they moved their headquarters there. Okay. Okay. I see. That was going to be my next question. Like, why would an adjutant be like a celebrated military figure? Because I did not think of them in the modern definition as a kind of person that's like in the forefront of headlines yeah, in yeah. warfare, but that makes sense. So did Andre have any training as an intelligence officer? Or did he just have a natural aptitude that led him to take that position as spy master or was it something else? No. So in fact, when Clinton was initially, General Clinton was kind of serving as his own spy master. He wasn't really a spy master, but just we'll call it military intelligence manager because this wasn't, we don't, we didn't have staff functions back then. Like we think about them now. And so Clinton was doing a lot of this on his own. And eventually when Andre came in as the adjutant, he said, you know, I, I think I could do this for you, boss. And so he ends up taking all these correspondence that are coming in and kind of sorting through them and putting them into kind of what we call a binder today of, you know, observations, but he had to sort through what was actually reliable intelligence versus some commander's, you know, opinion on what was happening. And so this mm -hmm. created a lot of problems. And so Andre kind of, he becomes the de facto manager, but you could actually argue his getting captured. And we'll, we'll talk about this where there's a couple spots, like modern people that operate in intelligence now would probably say it was super naive. And in fact, there's been some analyses of him in general and say, you know, Probably his ignorance is what led to his capture, but there's also a lot of things that they did that we would say, wow, that's actually quite uh, advanced. Like they use these, they had relatively advanced codes that they used to talk between each other. And even with, we talk about Arnold and, you know, communicating with Andre and Clinton, Arnold's identity, they assumed it and they presumed it was Arnold, Benedict Arnold that they were communicating with, but they actually didn't know. They only knew him by his code name, which was Gustavos. And so hmm. they, part of the whole reason they got together to meet was they finally decided like, we need to know for sure who this guy is and that he is who, you know, he's going to have reliable information and they, they had only presumed. So there's a lot of things that we'd say, well, it's actually fairly advanced, but there was also a lot of things that they, they just didn't know. It wasn't like military intelligence wasn't a developed function at the time in Washington uh, had the Culper spy ring. If you've ever watched the show Turn, which is based on a book called Washington Spies, both are very good, it actually talks about this. And Washington's spy ring was far more in advance of anything Andre or Clinton had at the time. Mm -hmm. I have watched some of that show. I haven't watched the entire series, but I believe that Andre is a major figure in that show, isn't he? Yeah, absolutely. He's one of the key mm -hmm. figures. Yep. Yeah, I thought so. I thought so. Okay, great. So we're, we're already getting to where Arnold and Andre are arranging a meeting, but there had to be a, a tremendous amount of stuff that happened leading up to that for Arnold to even consider reaching out to the British. So I want to talk about his career a little bit long before he considered going back to the British. So was he already an officer? Like, did he take a commission at the beginning of the war? Or was he already like a, uh, a colonial militiaman or something like that? Yeah, so he was a continental general by the time of all this. He was a continental general for most of the war. By the time we're kind of entering the story, he's he's been wounded. He's actually wounded multiple times and he has this, he's suffering a lot of ailments from this. And so he's actually in Philadelphia as kind of the military governor of Philadelphia. And this is where he begins to socialize with a lot of what we would call British loyalists at the time. And he ends up marrying actually the daughter of a British loyalist named Peggy Shippen. And Peggy oh, right. Shippen is, she happens to know Andre well. She was, you know, they, there's lots of accounts of her corresponding with Andre. And we don't really know, you know, kind of the extent of that relationship. But we do know that she was very good friends with Andre and that they continued to communicate. 
So Hmm. no coincidence that when Arnold ends up marrying Peggy Shippen, that there's a natural connection there. The second thing that happens is Arnold is actually court-martialed by his fellow officers, by fellow generals right around this time. And Arnold is also suffering from a lot of financial problems. He lived, he grew up relatively poor. He was poor before the war. He spent a lot of money financing his operations in the war, and he expected that Congress should repay him for this. Well, they rebuffed him multiple times. Hmm. And so he's living in Philadelphia. He's kind of living this lavish lifestyle, but he doesn't have the money to afford it. So during this time, in an account from an 1835 book on Arnold and Andre, so you could consider it kind of first generation of what happened. They actually talk about how Arnold approaches the the French envoy at the time to ask him for money. And the French envoy kind of rebuffs Arnold saying like, you realize how this would look, right? I, you know, I'm a representative of a foreign government. And he basically points out to them that, you know, if they were to loan Arnold money, that he would basically be subservient to the French government. And that just wouldn't mm-hmm. be honorable for an officer. And so Arnold is very frustrated and this it's right about this time that he reaches out to the British with General Clinton. And so about 18 months before 1780 or September 1780. So we're talking very early 1779, Arnold reaches out and begins to correspond with the British. And the British are at the time moving south and they're working in South Carolina. And so they're trying to actually get They suspect Arnold based on kind of the contextual information of court marshals and Arnold looking for money. And he presents, he gives them a lot of intelligence and they actually find his information is very accurate and valuable. So they, they know he's somebody high up. So they actually encourage him to seek a command in South Carolina. Well, he knows this isn't possible given his battle wounds and his kind of recuperation. So he actually tries to get West Point. He knows West Point's a key place. And so he actually seeks out the command at West Point. From multiple people and basically sets it up so that Washington will, will offer him this command. And he basically writes to the, the British and says, well, how about West Point? And the British immediately are like, that's just as good. <laughs> <laughs> and West Point at the time was considered kind of the key to New England. They, the British thought if they could cut off the Hudson River and control the Hudson River, they would cut off the head of the snake was what they would say. And so they thought, well, if West Point is kind of inhibiting us from controlling this line of communication for New England and New York. So if we could get West Point, we could really control the Hudson River. And so Hmm. West Point became a very attractive target for the British to want to be able to have influence over. Okay, I see. How big was it at the time? I know it's the site of the military academy now, but is this like 200 guys in a triangular fort or something like that? Or is it much larger? Yeah, so Arnold actually gives us the number. So when he writes, when he ultimately gives Andre the plans that we'll talk about, he actually lays out the exact number of cannon, the number of soldiers. We can tell actually what units they were from. And it's about 3,000 soldiers to garrison West Point. Oh, wow. So if you've, I assume most of you have not, most of you listening have not been to West Point, but it's actually the oldest garrisoned military base in America. And it's been continuously garrisoned since the American Revolution. And a lot of the sites that we'll talk about you are, are actually still there. Not all of them are accessible, but the, they're there. And it's actually a fort complex, like there's a whole fortress complex. So both at West Point proper, as we kind of know it now is the military academy. In fact, the, the plane where you see cadets on parade, that was actually what was known as Fort Arnold or was later called Fort Clinton. And there's actually some remnants of that. In fact, the exact location of that is a place called Kikusko's monument that you can go there, but there's other forts around, but it was a whole fortress complex. Hmm. And there's actually okay. some of it is actually across the river in what's now Garrison, New York. And you can see some of those spots as well. So a massive complex of forts. Okay. Yeah. I was not expecting 3000 guys at all. That's <laughs> enormous for the, for the time period. Certainly. Absolutely. So he gets this command and, and no one on, on the continental army side is the wiser at this point. Nobody's figured out what he is planning. Yeah. So nobody, nobody really suspected anything. And in fact, most of the, you know, kind of, after action reviews, if you will, like people kind of emerged and said, well, you know, there was some things and some of the dots that people connected after the fact, I'll walk through the only really clue that people had ahead of time was I had mentioned Washington's culpa ring. 
they were managed by Washington's head of intelligence. So kind of his counterpart, Andre, and his name was Benjamin Talmadge. And he was a cavalry officer, but he was also covertly acting as Washington's head of intelligence. And they had identified, the culpa ring had identified that there was a senior officer that had to be giving plans to the British. And there's no indication from Talmadge's memoirs, which he writes, I, I'll uh, put a link to those on my website, aaronstarkbooks.com. I'll have a page uh, set up for some of the sources we'll talk about. You can go there and you can read Benjamin Talmadge's uh, memoirs. And he does not indicate that he put two and two together based on what the Culpa Ring told him. However, there's also people were very concerned about like the Culpa Ring wasn't even really put together with who everybody was in the Culpa Ring until the 1930s. So oh, wow. there was a lot of secrecy there. So it's not real clear that Talmadge put together who, you know, the, the intel his spies had given him in New York City versus, you know, Arnold when it actually happened. That was kind of the only early indication that there might have been. As far as kind of like other people who said like, yeah, I kind of put two and two together. There's this really interesting story that like we'll be talking about. I'm going to talk about 13 days and it's September 11th. Uh, until September 23rd, 1780. And these are like literally the 13 days that kind of shaped the future or the survival of the American Revolution. Oh, man. And so during this period, there's a time where the British are trying to get in touch with Arnold to do this meetup. And they send the ship up, the HMS Vulture, and it will hear this name over and over again. It sails up and it's kind of like in view on the Hudson River around Stony Point, New York. So there's a battlefield there. It was where this place called King's Ferry was. And Arnold is going across a barge with Washington and Lafayette, Marquis de Lafayette. And they're going across the river and, and they see the barge out in the water. And Lafayette says this comment to Arnold. He's like, he's like, well, well you, should, you should ask this question. He's like, you're, you're in touch with the enemy. <laughs> and is what Lafayette meant is, you know, you are close to their enemy lines. You read a lot of their news reports, but Arnold became very, very defensive. And it struck all the mm. officers on the barge of like, whoa, what's he like? Why is he so upset? So that was one clue. And then the other clue is, is very interesting is during this time, the vulture is actually there. They're trying to get in touch with Arnold. So they send a letter to Arnold and it gets delivered to him when he's basically with Washington. And the letter is from, it, they do it under the auspices of this, you know, a colonel that works for the British who was an American, you know, Tory living in America and his property had been seized. And he requests audience with Arnold to dispute the property. Well, Arnold clearly knows this is a ruse to like bring him on board to talk to the British. And, but he's with Washington. So he, he asks Washington's advice, like, well, what should I do? They, you know, this colonel wants to talk about his property. Is it okay if I go on board? And Washington's like, no, that's a civil matter. You know, let the civil authorities take care of it. Like, not for you. And so they have to send a letter back. But this is the other one where people are like, wait a minute. Like, that was what was going on. But nobody put it together mm. until after all of this unfolds. Oh, wow. Very cool. So the first attempt is kind of rebuffed by Washington, who seems to be on top of things, but how, how do they continue to communicate after that? Yeah. So they continue to, so the, the September 11th is kind of the first attempt and they have two or three failed attempts where they try, they just can't make it. And keep in mind communications back then, they got to do everything by a runner with a letter mm -hmm. and all their letters are like, they're, they're all preserved for the most part. And so you can read them in there. They're all very kind of cloak and dagger. They, Andre doesn't, you know, he, he never uses the name Andre. He, he uses the name John Anderson and claims he's a merchant. And so eventually Arnold tells him like, okay, either meet me here or meet me there. And they end up deciding on the, the HMS Vulture comes up and parks off what is now Haverstraw, New York. And Arnold sees the ship is there and he gathers a couple guys to help him get out there all under the guise of, you know, hey, they're going to, the British, you know, I got that. He basically pitches it as there's a British soldier or somebody from the British army who's going to pass us information. So I need to go down there as the general to receive it. So hmm. it all adds up, makes sense. Got it. And then, so he gets this guy, Joshua Smith, who is, he's a very well-respected citizen, lives in Haverstraw, gets him to basically go on board the vulture. 
So Smith goes out there to the vulture to retrieve John Anderson. Well, John Anderson, AKA Andre, he is not expecting he's going to have to go on shore. In fact, when he came up to meet Arnold, Clinton gave general Clinton gave him three orders. He said, do not go behind enemy lines. Do not accept any documents and do not wear civilian clothes. So Andre's in his uniform. He puts on a cloak before he meets up with Smith on, on the boat. And so he's wearing kind of an overcoat. And so Smith eventually realizes Andre's wearing a uniform, but he claims that Arnold told him that, hey, it's okay that Andre's wearing a uniform. He's a civilian, he's a merchant, but he's just trying to, you know, feel important. So he wore this uniform, but he's not really a soldier. And so continues to kind of, okay, that makes sense. So anyways, they bring Andre onto shore and they meet in the woods. And this is, you know, where you can find the sign I mentioned. There's actually a rock down by the Hudson River that was carved in the late 1800s. This says something to the effect of this is where Andre landed. And I'll, I'll post a picture of it on my website. You can okay. check it out, AaronStarkBooks.com and, and see that. But you can actually go down to the river and see where this took place. And so Andre lands and he has to hike up. So you can actually, um, there's a pretty cool map I came across that was um, made in the 1880s. And it basically traces what the author at the time thinks was the path that Andre would have had to go up. It's kind of this old road he refers to it as. It's not really there anymore, but you can generally tell by the lines of drift, you know, where this road would have gone. So you can actually kind of hike up that road from the river. Uh, and then he refers to this intersection. And the intersection of the roads, the path now, one of the, the north-south path is actually Hook Mountain State Park path. Uh, and then the road that it intersects with is what's called the old Long Clove Road. And so the Long Clove Road is now overgrown, but you can actually see where it used to be there in the, in, in the mountains as it weaves up towards what's now 9W. And you can go to this intersection. So Andre is, or Arnold is waiting at this intersection for Andre. And so they talk through the night. And Smith is not, he claims he, he had no idea what they were talking about. They were, you know, further off in the distance. And Smith actually goes, claims he goes back to the boats. Well, then daylight approaches and Andre and Arnold haven't really come to terms yet with like what he's going to give and what he's going to get. So Andre kind of gets stuck of like, okay, well, it's daylight. We can't row back out there. And so Andre and Arnold end up going to Smith's house. And so they go up to Smith's house, which is now in where West Haverstraw is. There's a Ford dealer. And then there's actually a, a hospital up on the hill, the Helen Hayes hospital, where that parking lot is, is where the Smith house used to be. Hmm. And so they were in the Smith house and Andre and Arnold kind of finished their business and they, they come to terms on what's going to happen. And so then Arnold has to actually go back up to West Point. So he continues on up to West Point. And Andre and Smith are at Smith's house. And now they got to figure out how to get Andre back to the lines. So Smith was mostly unwitting. In this case, he didn't even realize that he would be meeting with a military officer until Andre came out in uniform. So it's a very debated question. In fact, at the time, they arrested Smith and gave him a court martial. They decided they didn't have enough evidence to hang him, but he was ultimately you know, viewed as being guilty is, you know, conspiring with Arnold, but he continued to say, like, I had no idea. Like, I just thought he was like a civilian. I just thought I was helping, you know, this mm -hmm. person that the American general asked me to help get back. I thought he was giving us intel. So it's, it's very much debated ever since the time. <laughs> and there's no real clear evidence one way or the other in the literature. Uh, I see. And do you know, or do we know what exactly were Arnold's demands or requirements? Was he asking for way too much or something like that? Is that why they had to debate so much or was it just arguing yeah. or, you know, settling the details, that sort of thing? Yeah. So a little bit was, it started off. So Arnold wanted to actually defect much earlier. He viewed it as he was hmm. being slighted as a general. And he thought, you know, he, if he went to the British, they would be able to use him as a general much better than the Americans. But general Clinton for the British, he actually didn't want Arnold to come over. He kind of viewed Arnold as a you know, he was, he was an okay general, but you know, the British had plenty of good field commanders. They didn't need another general like Arnold, like he would just be kind of average in the British army is kind of how they viewed it. And so hmm. he preferred Arnold to actually stay as a, as a spy. It was like much more, it was a much better arrangement for the British that way. So they yeah. kind of pushed it off as long as they could. And eventually 
it came to the point where the British, they really needed to cut off New England. They were trying to close out the war and they wanted to reach a point where they could just finally end this thing. And so they, he decides like, okay, look, we need to take West Point. So he basically says, okay, Arnold, like, or Gustavos, it's time. And so our, um, Arnold wants to know who he's going to communicate with. They finally agree that Andre is the best person for him to communicate with. That was kind of who had been running the communications for Clinton anyways. And so this idea that Andre and Arnold were going to meet was, was deemed acceptable. And Arnold wanted to be paid. He wanted to be paid commensurate with the risk. And so there's a lot of indications that actually he wanted more money than the British were willing to give him. He also wanted a commission as a general. So those were kind of like the two, the two main things. And then if the mission was successful, he wanted even more money. So they had to kind of negotiate what he was going to get. And then of course the British wanted the plans. And so they knew from some communications that Washington was actually going to be at West Point right around this time. So Washington had been over in Hartford meeting with the French fleet and he was coming back. And so Arnold had tipped them in a letter that, Hey, Washington's actually going to be at West Point. And so the British saw this as an opportunity of, well, great. That's awesome. Let's get the plans. And then they had sent their troops. They were getting ready to to dispatch them under the auspices of going up to the Chesapeake, but they actually viewed it as, no, we're actually going to sail them right up the Hudson. As soon as we get these plans, we're going to sail them right up the Hudson. We're going to land our troops. And in fact, Washington spy chief Talmadge claims when he was kind of accompanying Andre back, Andre actually walked him through this and said, you know, we were going to get the plans. We were going to bring the troops up. We were going to land right here, just a little south of West Point. We are going to march the troops up behind the mountains and actually come up over top where we'd be able to command West Point from the top. And then we would take over West Point and we'd capture Washington. We'd kind of like all be in one fell swoop, you know, within a day or two of getting these plans. So it was like fairly well calculated how they were going to execute on this. And so that was like really kind of what drove this from, you know, just being chatter back and forth to finally deciding, no, we got to execute and let's bring Arnold in. Wow. Yeah. If they had pulled that off, what a tremendous blow that would have been to the revolution. Yeah. And that's why I say like, this was literally the 13 days that d- defined the future of the American revolution. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I have to wonder if it could have, con- if it could have continued without West Point or without Washington at the helm. I mean, who, who have, you know, who knows? Yeah, absolutely. Before we go on, I want to tell you all about a new podcast from Tenderfoot TV called To Die For. Imagine you were a fly on the wall at a dinner between the mafia, the CIA, and the KGB. That's where this unprecedented podcast begins. Brought to you by the makers of the hit podcast To Live and Die in L.A., To Die For marks the first time a Russian-trained honey trap has told her story from beginning to end. Taught to seduce men for their secrets and sometimes their lives, Alia Rosa was trained to believe that her body no longer belonged to her. It belonged to the state. She was meticulously trained to be the perfect weapon, able to seduce her targets into compromising situations that have ended careers and sometimes lives. From Tenderfoot TV, the studio that brought you up and vanished, and to live and die in L.A., make sure you check out To Die For, available beginning on March 26th, wherever you get your podcasts. So why did this ultimately not come to fruition in that case? So Arnold's uh, up at West Point and Andre's with Smith. And as I mentioned, Washington's on his way back from Hartford. And so Andre crosses at King's Ferry with Smith. So again, right where the Stony Point battlefield is just north of that, you can kind of see where it is. If you visit the Stony Point battlefield, there's not much there anymore, but you can see where it was. And so they cross over across to the east side of the Hudson River. And they continue down, they're kind of in no man's land. And so eventually Smith kind of bids farewell to Andre and says, you know how to get back from here. And Andre says, yes. And Andre, there's some indications that Andre was actually really hoping to link up with the HMS Vulture, but that just became impossible. So he decided, okay, I'm gonna have to go overland. And he gets warned that, hey, there's a lot of people that are kind of like, thieves. It's kind of like some, there might be some friendlies, like some friendly British might be some Americans. You don't know who you're going to run into. So Andre begins going down and right kind of by the Terrytown area, he gets stopped by a band of, of, I think it's three individuals who basically kind of ask him like, Hey, who, who you with? 
And keep in mind, Andre is, by this point, he shed his military uniform. He's in civilian clothes. Smith had convinced him to change. And so by this point, Andre had basically broken all three orders. He had gone behind enemy lines. Mm -hmm. He had worn civilian clothes and he had accepted documents. And so he's, he's kind of there being questioned. And this is where one author I read kind of talks about this good indication that Andre was kind of naive. He... He viewed it as, well, I got, you know, 50-50 chance. They're either British or they're American. So he basically says he's on the British. And they say, oh, well, we're not. And <laughs> and so the author's like, you know, any more than an amateur could have figured out, you know, how do I equivocate this to at least figure out how do I get out of this? But Andre doesn't. He picks the wrong side. And then he realizes he's going to have to try and bribe him. So he thinks he's bribed his way out. He's offering him money, rewards. He offers them his watch. And then they finally decide, you know what, let's just rob him anyways. And so <laughs> he, because he's a, he's wearing these really nice riding boots. One of them decides he wants his, his riding boots. So he forces them to take them off. Well, lo and behold, all the documents he's carrying are in his riding boots. Oh man. And so they begin looking at these and they're like, these documents are all from Benedict Arnold. So is another author I read, it, you know, talked about. Arnold had spent years talking to the British in very like cloaked incognito language, but in there he like personally signs all the documents so he can show and prove that they're from him as the general. And so Andre also has a pass from Arnold. And so these guys are like, look, clearly you have something that's valuable. We're taking you to the American headquarters. So they take him straight to the American headquarters, which is right in that same area near Terrytown. I think it's in Newcastle and they take him to the Colonel there. And the Colonel there is, he's not quite sure what to do with it. He realizes that this is, you know, something doesn't look right. And he kind of puts two and two together because Arnold had been fishing around for, you know, the previous 10 days telling people like, Hey, if you come across a guy from the British lines named John Anderson, you know, it's very important that you bring him right to me. And so The colonel's like, you know, I was expecting a guy to be coming from the British lines. I didn't expect a guy being going through and nobody told me about this guy. So he's automatically starting to get suspicious, but he's also worried like, well, I don't want to be insubordinate. So he begins sending Andre with a letter up to Arnold, but he kind of hedges his bets a little bit. He knows that, you know, hey, there's just something that doesn't smell right about this. So he actually sends a letter to Washington with the plans that Arnold had sent with all of West Point's plans. So he kind of hedges his bets both ways. And he informs Arnold, hey, I've sent the plans because they're so important. It was such an important nature of, you know, what we captured this guy with. We wanted to make sure Washington was aware. And so we sent, you know, those under Washington. Here's Andre. So Andre thinks he's golden because he's like, hey, I'm headed right back up to Arnold. This is great. I'll link back up with Arnold and we'll both be, we'll flee together. Well, then Benjamin Talmadge, gets back involved. This is Washington's head of intelligence. And he was out on patrol at the time and he returns back and the Colonel kind of tells him what was going on. And Talmadge is like, you did, you did what? And he's like, no, clearly something is not right here. Mm. And Talmadge actually puts two and two together. He's like, you know, I got a letter from Arnold too, asking me, you know, 10 days ago to, if I came across this John Anderson to let Arnold know And he actually asked me to escort him. So there are some historians that think Arnold was actually trying to get Andre to kind of snag Washington's head of intelligence and bring him into the city. And there was actually another point where Arnold had basically said, hey, who if you can give us the names and addresses of the spies in New York City that you have, like, we just want to make sure we can take care of them and that, you know, if possible, we can even link them up with you know, this, this turn, this British turncoat that I've recruited. And so Talmadge begins to kind of put two and two together. Like, wait, there's a lot of things that just don't smell right. So he convinces the Colonel to pull Andre back and not send him up to Arnold. And so they go get, they go secure Andre. He comes back, but the letter is allowed to go forward to Arnold because the commander is still scared that he's going to be viewed as insubordinate for not letting Arnold know. Andre's back with Talmadge. And then this letter continues on up to West Point to Arnold. And Arnold is sitting down to breakfast the next day. And he's actually sitting down with some of Washington's aides. Uh, Washington was not quite there yet. His aides had come ahead. 
and they're um, meeting in what's known as Robinson House. And Robinson House is actually no longer there, but it's in roughly Garrison, New York. There's a sign there. You can still see where it sat. And so they're sitting in, in Robinson House and Arnold gets his letter and he immediately leaves. He, he basically runs down to his barge and he says he has urgent business at West Point and he's got to cross the river over to West Point to the main, well, where the military academy is now. And he's got to go over there and check things out and he'll be back later. So they're all like, okay, I get it, whatever. And so Washington never gets the letter that was sent to him with the plans. And so he arrives at Robinson House and he says, where's Arnold? And they're like, oh, he had to rush over to West Point. And Washington's like, okay, great. Let's head over there. We'll go tour the fort. So meanwhile, Arnold is heading down the river on his barge and he eventually links up with the HMS Vulture and gets back on board. So Arnold is safe in British lines. Andre is still down with Benjamin Talmadge, just north of Terrytown, and George Washington's touring West Point. He gets over there and he's confused because none of the soldiers there like even knew Washington was coming. And he's like, well, wait, isn't Benedict Arnold here? And they're all like, no, he never came here. And so Mm. Washington's like fuming. Like he said he was going to be over here. People said he came over here on urgent business. Where is he? So then Washington gets back over to Robinson House. By this point, the original letter had arrived with the plans for West Point. And the person who received it was actually Alexander Hamilton, who is one of Washington's aides. And he hands it to Washington and Washington immediately figures out what's going on. And so Washington actually orders the detachment to go arrest Benedict Arnold. Of course, by this time, he's already on the HMS Vulture. And so now Washington's realized that Benedict Arnold has defected and he has the plans for West Point. He's holding them in his hands. And so it's all starting to come together in full circle. Yeah, boy, the noose is tightening here, so to speak. Absolutely. Does Arnold have a, I guess we call it like a bug out plan these days? Have he been planning an escape route or is he like panicking completely and trying to figure out what to do at this point? So he, as he basically leaves Robinson House, there's a, there's actually a a historical marker. If you ever, if you go visit the area, it's called Arnold's flight. And it's basically the old road that goes from Robinson House Mm -hmm. down to the river. So he probably had, you know, 200 meters to go to get to the river. It's basically what's now close to the garrison train station which is also the ferry. If you ever, you can actually take the ferry sometimes from that to West Point and back and forth. In fact, when I was a cadet, I used to ride that all the time. That was right basically where Arnold flees on his barge. And is what's really interesting is he orders his, his oarsmen to take him down to the vulture and they think he's going down to like get intelligence. He tells them he's going under a flag of truce to get something. So the oarsmen are none the wiser. Well, so then they get down to the HMS Vulture and he talks to the captain of the ship and he gets on board. And then he turns around and tells the captain to arrest the oarsmen and says they're now, you know, prisoners of war. And the oarsmen are like so confused. They're like, what are you talking about? (laughs) And the captain didn't want to do it. The captain viewed this as like, hey, that's like really, that's like, you know, we're honorable. We're not going to do that. And wow. So they, but the captain felt like, no, Arnold's general, I have to honor it. So then when they get back to New York City, General Clinton also was like, you did what? And so he actually like (laughs) lets the prisoners go saying like, what are you talking about? You're going to arrest them. They're the ones that brought you to the boat. (laughs) And so Clinton ends up letting the oarsmen go. But that was how Arnold, that was his best bet to get back to New York City. Hmm. Okay. I see. And is he thinking at this point, like I have to get out of the the colonies entirely, I have to get back to England or something, or is he just hoping that, you know, they'll still triumph and he'll be able to stay where he is essentially? No. So Arnold actually becomes a general in the um, British army and he, he fights in a few minor battles, uh, but he's never, you know, he's never the hero he hoped he was going to be. He eventually does go to London. He basically ends up dying in obscurity in London, the British never really respected him. They kind of viewed him as a traitor and he was never respected there. And of course, nobody respected him here in America. You know, well, most people would consider him probably the most hated person coming out of the American Revolution or potentially in American military history. Yeah, no doubt about it. So did, was this like an extremely well-known event very quickly? He was already a, a well-known figure, you said, right? Like, was this making headlines all over the colonies? Yeah, so there was, there was actually a debate. Washington, so they had Andre and they were debating. They court-martialed Andre and they 
decided to convict him as a spy. But there was a debate. There was actually some correspondence between Washington and General Clinton. And the idea was floated like, well, hey, maybe we should just trade Andre for Arnold and then we can execute Mm -hmm. him. But General Clinton was very opposed to this because he didn't want he wanted to, like, make it so other American officers might be willing to come over to the British. So he did not agree to send to send Arnold back. But the problem was, is Andre was like, he was basically like a second son to, to Clinton. He was his, you know, his prized officer. And so this was very emotional event. And even in America, like Talmadge, when you read Benjamin Talmadge's memoirs, he talks about Andre as like, you know, he's very, he was a great gentleman. He was, you know, he says he almost cried when Andre was actually ultimately hung on October 2nd. And so a lot of Americans had a lot of respect for John Andre and they had no respect for Benedict Arnold. But the, this idea that maybe we can trade would be was initially a, a potential solution to being able to punish Arnold for what he had done. Hmm. Yeah, that's certainly sensible. And I, what a terrible choice that was left to the general then in that case, having to choose between Andre and Arnold because Arnold had already kind of used up all of his value, it sounds like. And it seems like they kind of knew it. At that point, too. Yeah. And in, in Andre, you know, initially he he really he kept maintaining this, that he was John Anderson. And eventually Talmadge put together like this guy is clearly a soldier. He's not a merchant. And Talmadge never said anything to him about it. But the guard that was watching Andre told him, he's like, hey, they, they think you're a military officer. And so at that point, Andre knew the gig was up. And so he actually requests a piece of paper and he pens a note to Washington and tells him everything. He says, hey, wait, I should say everything. He tells him like, hey, I came here. I was in my uniform. I was forced by circumstances to, to shed my uniform, but basically trying to convince him I'm a soldier. I'm not a spy. And Talmadge reads this and is like, holy cow, this is like not only a soldier. This is literally the adjutant for General Clinton and the head of mm-hmm. intelligence. And so Talmadge knows immediately this is a big deal. Well, our, our Andre tries to convince Washington not to hang him as a spy, but to give him the firing squad as an honorable officer. Oh, and initially he thinks Washington has agreed to this. And so Andre heads to his execution and he's actually surprised to see there's no firing squad and that there's actually a noose. And he says to Talmadge, he's like, what happened? And Talmadge is like, well, sorry, this is like the way it's going to be. And part of this had to do with Washington initially was okay with the firing squad or people surmise he was okay with this, but then he was worried that people would view it as like, no, Andre's a spy. He gets to die a spy's death. He ends up deciding, you know, kind of for the political reasons that no, he has to execute Andre as a spy. And a lot of this was influenced by this guy who was killed early in the American Revolution named Nathan Hale, an American spy who knew nothing of what he was doing. At the beginning of the revolution, he was quickly captured and he was hung by the British. And Nathan Hale was like kind of viewed as this hero that had, you know, unceremoniously been hung as a spy. And so this was lurking in the back of everybody's mind. And in fact, Andre, when he's trying to figure out what's going to happen to him, he asked Talmadge, you know, what do you think is going to happen to me? And Talmadge basically says, you know, my classmate from Yale was Nathan Hale. Do you know who that was? And Talmadge claims that Andre said, yes, I I knew who Nathan Hale was. A lot of historians dispute this, you know, part of the story that Andre probably did not know who Nathan Hale was. But anyways, he says yes. And Talmadge basically says, well, you're going to probably suffer the same fate he did. And this is like the first time that it occurs to Andre, like you may actually die. Like you're not going to be prisoner exchanged. Like you may actually die as a spy. And so that was playing on a lot of the, you know, factors that led to Andre being killed as a spy as opposed to a, you know, killed by firing squad as an officer. Hmm. Dang, I, I have some empathy for the guy, I have to admit. I mean, he was like a, a professional doing his job and and got caught up in some politics and emotions and related to someone that he probably did not even know. And this is the end result of that in, in a sense. Absolutely. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, if I recall correctly from the show Turn that you mentioned earlier, like I said, I haven't seen it all, but he was portrayed as a, a pretty villainous guy, wasn't he, in that series? 
Am I remembering that correctly? It's been a while. You're probably thinking of Colonel Simcoe is in the... Oh, am I? Yeah, so Colonel Simcoe is the one in the show Turn who they portray as kind of this villain. And then Andre is kind of like the suave, you know, chief of staff who is, you know, guiding the army. Um, Okay, okay. I must be. Yeah, that makes sense. It's been several years since I watched it. I should go back and watch it again. Yeah, very good show though. Very good show. Yeah, it definitely is. I'm actually a little bit surprised that the only... That they did not consider not just a prisoner exchange, but I guess just holding him until the end of the war... I assume that they would consider a high, they wouldn't necessarily execute a high ranking officer if he wasn't, you know, doing something, you know, committing what we might think of as war crimes, that sort of thing now. But I guess that was exactly what happened. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Hmm. So Arnold lives in, with the shame of it and in obscurity, but he does live a long life after that. And Andre has, was it just a few days after he was caught that he was ultimately executed or was there some back and forth? Yeah. So he was executed. So he's caught on the 23rd and ultimately executed on, I believe, October 2nd. Ah, okay. Okay. So two weeks or so. Yeah. Wow. Man, what a story. So Arnold, obviously his name is synonymous with, with treachery and betrayal these days is Andre. Is he, is he remembered very well on the British side? Do you think? So I think generally speaking, Andre is, you know, most most history would kind of view Andre in a generally positive light. He was maybe more a circumstantial to the story. And I think his mm-hmm. general treating of the situation once he was captured and even kind of his reputation leading up to that has led history to kind of view him in a more positive light or at least a neutral light. I don't know if he's necessarily, you know, we think of the American Revolution as like the war that happened. Keep in mind for in British history, it's only a small chapter of a, of a long military (laughs) history. So, and even at that time when the war was going on, there's a lot of other things going on and, you know, we kind of view it as central to what was happening to us, but from the British perspective, it was, you know, one war of of many campaigns that were taking place. So we were just kind of a, a chapter in that. So I would say the Andre is not necessarily viewed one way or the other and, and just more neutral with obviously Arnold, you know, his legacy, at the time, people called it, you know, tur- we call it, we say turncoat or turning coat. People called it turning Arnold. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he's even at West Point, his name is scratched off in the old West Point Chapel, which is by the cemetery. His name is was scratched off by cadets in the 1800s because he oh, was wow. viewed as his name didn't deserve to be in there because he was not an oh. American general anymore. And so, yeah, so he just has not been, for, for good reason, been viewed by history. Although there there is a recent book that was published this year which I have not read, but the reviews say that, you know, some of it is that uh, tries to portray Arnold in in a little more positive light, or at least, you know, you could say a less one-sided light. I think, you know, all the histories that have been written portray Arnold in in fairly one very negative light and for good reason. Supposedly this account tries to give it a little more both sides of the story view. Yeah, that does sound interesting. I'll have to look for that, certainly. So you've mentioned a a ton of different markers and and locations all around that area, like around New England, basically. Is there an easy way for people to find those? Because I honestly love that sort of thing myself. Yeah. So I will, I'll put on my website kind of a map, you know, where some of these things are. I think, you know, the the place to start, if you want to see it is go to Haverstraw. There's Hook Mountain State Park. It it, um, basically starts in Nyack and then is about a five mile trail that ends in Haverstraw. You want to access it from the Haverstraw side. In just about 500 meters from the start of the trail, or maybe even a little less, you'll find the sign. In just south of that sign, about about another 100 meters, you'll find the intersection in the woods. Hmm. Okay. Very cool. Yeah, I'm going to have to bookmark that. I've got a lot of spots bookmarked all over the country, but especially on the eastern seaboard, of course, with these, you know, so much happened between New York and Washington, D.C. and that sort of thing. So. I'll have to add those for the next time I'm in the area. Yeah. And then I I would say if you want to continue on, probably the easiest places that you'll be able to access is you can hit up right as you go out from the Hook Mountain State Park area, you're going to go by a modern, it looks like a giant 360 degree road that's a ramp. So they call it the Short Clove Road. Uh, And right by there is a uh, housing area called Harbors. And that is actually the site of uh, what used to be known as Kearse's Landing. And that's kind of the site that Arnold and Andre really kind of cross back into American lines. They talk about getting stopped by a century at that point. And so once you kind of cross, you know, by the harbors, you're kind of crossing into American lines, so to speak. And then you can actually continue up 9WU. You can go to Stony Point. It's a battlefield. Beautiful. It's kind of viewed as like the Gibraltar of the Hudson. 
and it sticks out into the water. You can go see it. Beautiful views. That is the Americans held that fort after a battle. And so that's where King's uh, Ferry was. And before you get there, um, you're going to pass a Ford dealership uh, that'll be on your left. And that's where the Robinson house is. So up on the hill, you'll see a parking lot for a hospital. Uh, and we're basically right where that parking lot sits to the south side of the hospital is where Robinson House was. And then if you um, do have access to West Point or you take a tour of West Point, you can actually go see the plane, uh, which is where the um, f- the main fort was, what was known as Fort Arnold. And you'll see up in the hillside, there's Fort Putnam, which was a big fort back then. And it's still a, a big fort now. Um, it's maintained as kind of a historical site. And then actually up kind of by the, um, if, you're, if you uh, do have access to the base and um, are able to get around there is up by the, the PX um, on the hill, there's the Child Development Center. Right behind that is what's known as Readout 4, which is kind of a small stone fortress with probably the best view of West Point and the Hudson Valley, Valley that you'll find. But up there was actually kind of one of the key forts that Arnold writes about in his correspondence with Andre. And he actually talks about readout four. So you can actually, there's a sign up there that shows kind of the letters that Arnold wrote about readout four. And you can go up there and you can see it and it's still preserved up there, beautiful views. And then of course you go to the other side of the river. Now we're in the garrison side, the east side of the Hudson, you'll be able to find Robinson house. And that is, again, the house itself is not there, but you'll be able to find the historical marker uh, for what was there. And lastly, I will post on my website a link to a book that was written actually in 1899, uh, but it's actually really good. And it has a lot of early photos from that period of the spots. So the author actually went and took photos. So there, a Robinson house was still there. The Smith house was still there. So you can actually see pictures of these places that are no longer exist. So I'll put the link to that book on my website. It's you know free to access as an old book. So uh, it'll be there. And definitely worth checking out, especially if you want to kind of go retrace the steps or retrace the route of this, you know, critical area during American history. That does sound like a lot of fun, like a great day trip right there. If anybody's in the area at all, so much to see. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Fantastic. So Aaron, now that uh, Disrupting Time has been out for a little while, are you working on another book or any other big project besides your full-time employment anyway? Yeah. So Disrupting Time obviously is a big project, way more than I imagined when I started, but the book has done extremely well. And I, you know, have really enjoyed both, you know, the publishing process and even, you know, after talking to a lot of podcast hosts and journalists and whatnot, and just kind of uncovering a period of history that had not uh, been known before. And so I've really enjoyed that. And I continue to do some speaking related to that book. As far as, you know, kind of next projects, I really enjoy this topic. I haven't decided, you know, to formally turn it into a book, but you know, very well could be. So if you're, if you're interested and you know, I'd love to hear from you, if you'd love to see this turned into a book or if you're a publisher, would love to see it turned into a book. I'd love to hear from you too. But in the meantime, no new projects per se, but you know, please feel free to continue checking out disrupting time and telling the the saga of those two Swiss spies that uh, came to America in 1876. You can find it on both Amazon and Audible, or as well as my website, aaronstarkbooks.com. Awesome. Yeah, thank you. That was an absolutely fascinating book. One of my favorites that I've read in a long time. Just something that was, it was a little bit of a departure from the typical like national security stuff I touch on, but absolutely riveting the way that they're, the, all the same skills were used on an economic front and the lasting changes that it created all the way back then and kind of the repercussions going forward. So that was very, very fun to learn about. Yeah, absolutely. And I always great to to hear from readers that enjoyed it. So please consider reaching out. Sure. Yeah. And I'm also, you know, I'm in a uh, Waltham Watch Collectors Facebook group and I've seen the book come up several times since our interview. So it seems to have made like a big impact within that collector community as well. Yeah. 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 The book um, is, you know, developed, I would say quite the audience, both in the, in the watch world, both the, the collector crowd, the, the modern crowd, but even just with historians. And so it's always fun to kind of hear who the book resonates with and who enjoys it. And, you know, love if you are in a book club and you want me to, to, to chat with your book club or anything like that would be more than happy to join. I enjoy, you know, always connecting with readers who enjoy the book. Oh yeah, that would be cool. Very cool. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Aaron. So do you have, I know you mentioned your website, aaronstarkbooks.com. Are you also have like any social media profiles or anything like that? If people want to follow along on your journey? Yeah. So I am a relatively social media novice, but I do have both Instagram, 
I don't do a whole lot on Twitter, but I am on Instagram. I'm on LinkedIn. Feel free to uh, connect with me any of those places. And again, my website, AaronStarkBooks.com. I have a lot of material on there related to primarily to my other book, Disrupting Time, a lot of historical documents and whatnot from the research, which if you're into that, you can read a spy's original report from 1876, which I know, Justin, you're familiar with. You can read that on the website. And then I also have, I'll I'll post items from today's chat as kind of a, you know, additional research interests page. And you can check out some of the sources and photos of the places I mentioned. Okay. Yeah, that's great. I've been on the website several times and there's a lot to parse through there. It's all very interesting stuff. So thanks for your time, Aaron. I really appreciate it. This has been a great talk and it was uh, good to hear from you again. Yeah, thanks. Appreciate it. All right. Take care. If you're interested in more of Spycraft 101, look for my page on Instagram at Spycraft 101. You can also find more great articles on my website, spycraft101.com. Thank you all for listening and I hope you'll stick around because there's lots more to come. Disclaimer. This podcast is for entertainment purposes only. The stories and statements expressed herein are experiences and opinions. They may not reflect the views of the host or the production studio. It's okay if you disagree with our content. No piece of media is right for everyone. If you love Spycraft 101, please check us out online, on Instagram, on YouTube, and especially on Patreon. Thank you for listening.